Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to uh, this very nice uh, uh, seminar uh, by Professor Marcelo uh, Simoes. So I will quickly introduce uh, uh, everything and how we move forward. First, uh, thank you very much for being a part of this, uh, this seminar. We are happy to have you here. Uh, today we will have a dear guest, a very well-known professor and researcher who will introduce to us some new topics, upgrade our knowledge and provide some hints that ignites some ideas for our uh, future work. So a brief introduction of our keynote speaker today. So if I uh, try to introduce Professor Simoes uh, in a full version way, so it may take the whole uh, meeting as uh, uh, he did a great job, great contribution in uh, this area of research. So Professor Marcelo Godisimues is a professor of flexible of a smart power system at the University of Vasa in Finland, worked at the University of Sao Paulo for about 11 years and then um, worked at the, uh, as a professor at the University of Colorado School of Mines uh, for about 21 years. Uh, he's a volunteer faculty at the University of Denver in USA, coordinated and managed more than 30 uh, research projects, some of them very large in size, with funding some US government grants or industry contracts, and published 12 books, 15 uh, book chapters, and around 300 scientific uh, works, and has several patents. He's an IEEE fellow member since 2016 uh, for application of artificial intelligence in control of power electronic systems. Uh, very interesting, Professor Simoes is historically the first person uh, who applied neural network and fuzzy logic in power electronics, motor drives, and renewable energy systems. His fuzzy logic based modeling and control for wind turbine optimization is used as a basis for advanced wind turbine control. He is volunteering to IEEE in many societies, particularly he has a strong commitment to IEEE, IES mission and vision. Uh, Professor Simo has made a substantial and uh, lasting contribution to artificial intelli intelligence technology in many applications, power electronics and motor drives, fuzzy control of wind generation systems, mm, such as fuzzy logic based waveform estimation for power quality, ne neural network based estimation for uh, vector controlled motor drives and integration of alternate native uh, energy system to the electric grid through AI modeling based power electronic control. His current research interests intersect the areas of power electronics, power system, power quality, smart grid and renewable energy system. And the, today's topic will be power electronics, artificial intelligence and real time modeling simulation and control for the transition toward a renewable energy economy. Today, our moderator will be uh, Karar Mostafa. Uh, he is an associate professor at Aspen University and now sitting very close to me uh, next office uh, here at Alto University. Uh, thank you also, uh, Karar, for, for accepting this. Now, a bit uh, information about ITRIBIL Finland section uh, and ITRIBIL IESPS Finland joint chapter, which I am uh, the chair of uh, both section and chapter here. We have more than a thousand members. We are very active in organizing conferences like ICC 2021 was here, ISIE 2023 is here. So still it's open. You can submit your paper for ISIE 2023, EM 2023, etc. And organizing some workshops and summer schools as well. For example, we had two summer schools last year. Then we believe that winning is determined by what happens before the game. So we are here to prepare our, ourselves for uh, the game, for changing the future. And for this, we need professional mentors, collaborators, uh, and we invite for this purpose, we invite well-known professors, researchers, and uh, uh, some practical people from academia and industry. Uh, so. Take this opportunity and make your future brighter. So we help our members 
then together we help our society because together we are stronger, together we make changes, together we can move faster toward the carbon neutral uh, future. So before ending, I would like also to uh, show you a very interesting personal web page by Professor Simoes. So don't hesitate to check this web page. It has a lot of very nice stories, very nice uh, uh, information here. Uh, so I personally enjoy a lot. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for, for this very nice page. So I've learned a lot uh, and I, I came to know some very uh, nice and contributors, great contributors in our um, society. Okay, thank you so much. Now the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much again, uh, Marcelo, for your kind uh, acceptance of this uh, meeting. Thank you very much, Mahdi. Very, very nice introduction, particularly because you you are trying to motivate students and young researchers. Very cool, very nice. I love it. And thank you for my web page. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's very interesting indeed. Thank you. My web page is not, it used to be my curriculum vitae on the internet. I decided to be more personal. So if you visit my web page, maybe every three to six months, I will add something. It will be a little more like a story tech, you know, <laughs> a little bit of stories, but with technology. I'm an engineer and I have a little bit of scientific perception of this issue. So that's why I try to write a little bit of philosophy. And maybe later I will tell a little bit about things in my life, but this will be a, maybe in two years, but I have everything here. Okay, thanks very much. So I will share my screen. Uh, yes, you, 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 you can share your screen. Now you are a co-host as well. And as I share my screen, you should see already yes. the first slide. So just to test, okay? Yes, sure. Um, I have, as you see here, 109 slides, which is impossible to give in 50 minutes. Okay. So I'm sorry <laughs> that I have so many slides. Yes. Uh, Mar Mar Marcel, before you, you start, uh, you know that I have already shared with you that uh, I need to uh, leave for another meeting. So um, uh, Carol will take care of the rest of the meeting and then the our participants can ask their question in, in chat. Okay. So thank you very much. And the, the meeting is recording. Okay. Have a okay. good uh, time with your next meeting. Thank you very and much. I take care from here. It's great. Thank you. Thank you very cool. much. Thanks everyone who are here today to listen to me. It's a great pleasure to talk to people. It's a great pleasure to motivate people. You know, so I hope uh, that in this uh, lecture, I can give you a little bit of motivation to, I don't know, maybe some ideas or some different perceptions. If I do that, I'll be happy. And if I do that, and if five years you tell me that I did that for you, I will be even happier because from time to time, I get some nice communications of people saying that because this or because of that, because I read this or because I have done something with you 10 years ago, something changed. Yeah, it's nice, you know, because our life is full of stories and we have to collect those stories. Okay, so uh, as you see here, that's my long title. I usually like long titles, okay? The names of my kids are short, my children, but uh, everything else in my life is long, <laughs> long titles. Power electronics, AI, and real-time modern simulation control for the transition towards a renewable energy economy. Pretty much I'm trying to, sh to say in this title everything that I believe is important for my current research, okay? So as you see, I don't have a table of contents because if you watch a movie, you don't have a table of contents. So I try to do more or less on the same idea. So that's the beginning forward, okay? If we think on the past uh, a little more than 200 years, we can already find, somebody has an open mic, so maybe we can ask uh, everyone else to mute because there's a noise here. But uh, we can uh, look to the past a little more than 200 years. We could go a little bit further 
but we do this because there is a historical perception here that's relevant to us as engineers, okay? Before the Industrial Revolution, what do we have? What did we have? We had manual work, animal work, horses, people doing labor on farms, and even in fabrication of materials and stuff. So let's call that muscle age, okay? It's not really my terminology. Uh, my advisor was Professor B.K. Bowles, and he used to tell this muscle age, okay? And then after the muscle age, right, you have to use our muscles. What happened is we had the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was possible because England had coal, okay? And there's a story, very nice. You know, Enrique VIII, who went to divorce and start a new church in England? Yeah, that person. He took all the, uh, all the lands from the church, from the Catholic church, and confiscated <laughs> because he created a new church. And then that area had a lot of coal. And England start to have coal because they start to mine on the areas that used to be with the previous church that no longer exists in England. Because England had a lot of coal. So somebody had the great idea to have steam and somebody had a great idea to have a piston and a shaft and things that move. So we had the invention of steam engines and heat engines. So that's what we call mechanical age. And we usually associate this in the history uh, that we study as the industrial revolution. Industrial revolution was something that started to happen in England that we try to substitute the animal labor, horses, for example, with a machine that was capable to crush, to move and do things instead of animal, because the machine was more powerful. The machine didn't have to eat. The machine didn't get tired. The machine didn't have to sleep. So it was great to have a machine instead of horses, okay? So uh, uh, this is uh, important because uh, eventually we have the Victorian period that was great in UK because we had the Industrial Revolution, but we have a lot of arts and artists, so it's another story as well. But we, we start to understand what we, what we conceptualize today as electrical engineering and computer engineering and things that are relevant to us as the electrical age. You see here, electrical age, we could say that's the invention of electrical machines, also, uh, not the invention of electricity, but how to say the utilization of electricity in a way that could be used by uh, people, okay? In 1850, there was a prime minister in England that uh, asked Faraday, what's the value of electricity? And Faraday, who is a scientist, was a scientist. He said, sir, one day we are gonna tax it. That was in 1850, okay? And then we had all the story we, we know about uh, uh, Maxwell, Hebside, and uh, Thomas Edison. He didn't invent the DC machines, okay? But he used the DC machines and Nikola Tesla and the electrical power. But the electricity was kind of uh, well established before the turn of the century. Okay, electricity reminds electrons, isn't it? Yeah, electrons. So we think electricity is made of electrons. But the electron was discovered in 1898. So the electron was discovered two years before 1900. And we already had uh, induction machines. We already had electrical circuits. So everybody knew what was electricity before the electrons were discovered. That's amazing. So we call that electrical age. And then we have the electronics revolution on the 20th century, particularly after the second world war. And uh, then there's a continuation of this and the continuation I will be talking in a few slides. But when you talk about this uh, revolution, the industrial revolution, the electrical revolution, the electronic revolution, 
we had a steady increase of use of energy and most of the energy, of course, were possible because fossil fuel concentrates a lot of energy in the gasoline, in, in gas, propane, in everything, okay? So what happens is that we have pollution, okay? We have environmental pollution by fossil fuels with coal, oil, natural gas. So this environmental pollution will have some extra uh, debris on the atmosphere that will become associated with uh, oxygen. And then we have these new molecules that will maybe give you acid rain, uh, will be on the big cities as urban pollution. And eventually this will trap the flow of air and we call that as a problem of global warming because we have the huge acceleration of production of pollution because of humankind. Some people do not want to accept this, but that is what it is. So how can we do to solve or mitigate climate change? Well, we could promote uh, better efficient ways. So promote energy usage in electrical form, uh, if we centralize the fossil fuel electric power generation, we can try to have uh, advanced emission control. They say modern power plants, but still fossil fuel. We could eliminate coal and develop a clean coal technology with CO2 capture. There are many, many possibilities. And sometimes we have governments investing on that. Some people say that we could increase nuclear power. Uh, I say debatable because this is a, a speech, but in my personal base, I, I usually say that uh, I'm against this. I'm against of increasing nuclear power for many reasons, okay? We could preserve rainforests. We could maybe control human animal population. That's deb debatable as well, because this is not, how to say, a regime that we want. This happened already, and we do not want this kind. So this is not even debatable. You know, I say debatable, but it's not for me at least. But if you promote the use of a renewable energy source, high wind, solar, tidal, wave, geothermal, biofuels, if you replace the internal combustion engines with electric vehicles or hybrid, if you promote more and better mass electric transportation with better buses and trains and uh, surface uh, transportation, we could save energy. So this requires a lot of uh, conversion of electricity. And this is possible because we have power electronics. So what we have here in this box is power electronics intensive, okay? And when you look about uh, the possibilities of uh, replacing fossil fuel in near in the present and near future, this is uh, uh, this is not really a real data because this was a Gaussian a Gaussian uh, function with some data that we took from uh, United Nations uh, reports, but it's expected that uh, coal mm, it, it didn't peak yet. Okay, can it still extract coal? There is a lot of coal in the world, in, in many places, okay? But sooner or later, there is a peak, okay? But we have a lot of coal. We can still dig our earth and take coal here on the, on the surface. But eventually, if you keep doing what you're doing, then we, we have less and less reserves of coal. And I don't know, one day may end, okay? Uh, there are some ideas that mm, could last 200 years, could last 300. It's not going to last 10,000 years. You know, it's going to last a few hundred years. Okay. And people say, yeah, nuclear power plants, they are lovely. I don't think so for many reasons. And one is this first, the amount of energy that we take from uranium plutonium is way less than the amount of energy. This is energy. Okay. Is not power, it's energy. And uranium, if we we mine everything and use everything in the world, I don't know, it may take 50 years. 
oil will peak and you take, uh, I don't know, more, a hundred more years. Gas also, and you see the problems we are having today with the war and what's happening all over the world with uh, gas and oil. And people are saying that uranium is a solution. It's not, okay? The solution is this uh, slope here. If you keep increasing the alternatives, the renewables, the hydro, okay? Maybe you can have some nuclear as well, but then we have to replace the nuclear by other solutions. Eventually, we may have a capability here to supply energy to our planet. Our planet uh, 10 years ago used to require 480 exajoules. And now our planet needs uh, around 530 or 525 exajoules. And this amount of energy that we need to power the whole world, transportation, electricity, buses, everything, everything, boats, airplanes, this 400, no, this 520 exajoules we have in one hour of sunlight on the earth, okay? So the sun shining on the surface of the earth, on the whole surface for one hour is the energy that we need to power our planet. So if you are able to capture that, of course, it's impossible to capture all of that in one hour, but that means that we have more than 8,000 times availability of growth of renewable energy to still power the size of our civilization needs. I include this chat because I'm going to talk about AI and I was expecting that maybe somebody is going to ask me about chat GPT. Okay, chat GPT first is not my expertise, okay? But I do kind of understand what chat, chat GPT is like a product because uh, 30 years ago, I had a DOS computer and I had a Lisp compiler. <laughs> and I remember we compiled a database for an expert system. That was in 1986 or 1987. It was one of the first things we did in our group of young engineers and students in Brazil, when I was in Brazil, to use LISP as an expert system. If the expert system is good enough and with a good database, it has some answers. So chat GPT is well more developed than that. But particularly initially people say, Wow, that's amazing. And then there's a little bit of, damn, this doesn't work. And then you say, okay, I got it. Maybe it's gonna be useful. It's a tool, okay? It's a tool, like you use Fourier Transform, like using a spreadsheet, chat GPT is a tool, okay? And it's not gonna find you anything new, but can help you, okay? So what's this? AI-based expert systems such as chat GPT could really help us do you think so? This could be another de debatable thing. That this is something that I would like to debate. But if you look on what we have first, on the top here, Spectrum is a, is a magazine that we receive from IEEE. And there is this, uh, this uh, article that Markov, yeah, Markov, the same one for Markov chain, okay? And Markov, Markov process and Claude Shannon, you know, the father of the communication theory, they built what we call first language model, okay? Markov took a certain book and started to extract all the consonants. And then he found that looks like the knowledge of this book is on the consonants and the vowels are there just for making you able to talk. And then Shannon made the theory about that, about that. So they had a paper on that, okay? And eventually, a few years later, Claude Shannon wrote the beginning of the information theory. So ChatGPT has a long story, but it's an AI. AI is a vast ocean with many things. Neural networks is one of them, deep learning, fuzzy logic, everything is AI. AI is this big and immense ocean artificial intelligence. And then we have islands of things that we do in this ocean. And one of them is this 
natural language processing. The paper Attention is All You Need was published by Google in 2017, and they presented, Google presented what they call Transformer for Analysis and Language Pattern Learning. It was an algorithm that they incorporate on Google search. This algorithm is called BERT, B-E-R-T, Bidirectional Encoder Representation from Transformer. It's not a transformer like power systems, okay? They call it transformer, but it's not the transformer that takes a voltage to another voltage. It's a neural network technique for processing language. And Google incorporate that on Google search to uh, improve their search, okay? For example, if you write the phrase 925 and a quarter to five, it's the same two here. However, they have different meanings. A nine to five could be many things. Could be I work from nine to five. Is the whole day nine to five? Okay, is my working time? Let's say, okay. And a quarter to five means fifteen minutes to five o'clock. Okay. So the word to here has two different meanings, which might be obvious for you and me when used in our context. But in a machine, in a search, is not. So BERT is designed to distinguish this nuance and to have relevant results. So there is an open source BERT in November 2018. That means you can contribute to Google. And if you do that, they will be happy that you are working for free. But they have this available for you to, to work. As chat GPT has also an investment on that. So this, is, this lecture today is not about chat GPT. But I knew that this could be kind of relevant because everybody's talking about chat GPT. I usually use artificial intelligence and fuzzy logic neural networks for control systems, for modeling engineering systems. So it's not really for natural language processing. Okay. Here, I, I, you cannot see this, <laughs> I know. Okay, but what's this in front of you? You have this page and this page here, here in my office, I have a frame, okay? So whoever came to my office here, where I am now on my left, like uh, two meters from here, I have like a frame of a poster is uh, one meter high, about uh, 40 or 50 centimeters wide. So we have here, see left, right and middle. Okay. On the left is a timeline for artificial intelligence. On the right is a timeline for electrical engineering. And in the middle, I have some milestones. I could not fit a timeline here because it would be very crowded. But there are some happenings in computer technology. And pretty much starts in 1819 and ends at 2019. So it's 200 years. So here I try to capture 200 years of things that happened in AI and electrical engineering with some descriptions of computer technology. If you go to the next page, I have the top part, then I have the middle part, and then I have the bottom part. I cannot even zoom also, but let's see. The next page is here. You can read a little bit, I hope. I don't know, but they will try to describe. Here, in, 18, in 1819, Charles Babbage, he made the first computer. It was an electro, not electrical, it was a mechanical computer, okay? And the first person who wrote a software for that computer was Ada Lovelace, okay? So she is considered to be the first programmer in the history, okay, Ada. And she was the daughter of uh, Lord Byron. And see, this was 1842 that uh, they had a uh, computer written for that machine. In 1854, George Boole, the owner of the Boolean logic, he wrote an investigation of the laws of thought on which are found the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. It's a theoretical book, but it's a book that allows you to write mathematics called Boolean logic. And that was 1854, okay? So the computer that was made uh, 90 years later was based on the Boolean logic that was proposed uh, 90 years before, almost 100 years before. So around the same time, here you see that in 1882, the DC distribution was in Newark with AC transmission higher voltage. See, 1887, Nikola Tesla invented the wound and rotor induction machine. 
There are some accounts that uh, the induction machine was invented by two people in different places. One was Nikola Tesla, another was in Europe. But Nikola Tesla patented and he had some writings about that. So we usually say that was a Nikola, a Nikola Tesla invention. And also the radio was invented by Nikola Tesla and everybody believed it was Marconi. That's another story to tell in another time. Okay. So you see here that uh, in 1894, Niagara Falls had the first induction machines uh, designed by Westinghouse. So pretty much you can say, wow, electricity is up and running here because we have induction machines already. But the electrons were not discovered, you know? They understood electricity as flow of charge, but they didn't know how those charges were, if their electrons or nothing. And I wrote, I read a paper another day that if you really have a big uh, copper line, let's say a bigger copper line, let's say from here to the moon, okay? And let's say that the copper line uh, has a very low resistance area and you can light a bulb there, okay? Suppose you turn a switch here and your light bulb is in the moon and then you have a, a wire, let's say, just imagine that. So you can say that the electron will travel to the moon, go to the light bulb and come back. No, this will not happen because the electron will not travel there. <laughs> and the AC, CAC transmission usually say the uh, electrons will go back and forth. No, they just moved a little bit in the same space. There is no actually transition of electrons like this, you know? It's a little more complicated than that, okay? Okay, so uh, here we have AI, here we, here we have electrical engineering, and around this, uh, the Second World War, we have uh, some important things happening. For example, uh, Clark, Edith Clark, another woman, very important one. She has the Clark uh, transform transformations. So he wrote those transformations. He wrote a book. He, she is considered to be the first electrical engineer who became a professor in the history, okay, in the United States. And she worked for General Electric. General Electric, by the way, belonged to Thomas Edison before. Okay. Um, then we had Park uh, that also helped with uh, synchronous machines. So you see here that uh, the modern solid state trans uh, transition started. We just announced, announced the 75th birthday of the transistors. It's here. And then we had the invention of photovoltaics, uh, PNP. And then in 1958, General Electric introduced the thyristor. In accordance to Professor B.K. Bose, Power Electronics birthday is in 1958. Of course, before that, we had some power things. For example, see, invention of the Mercury arc, uh, arc rectifier. It was a vacuum tube, okay? And it was like a diode, okay? So, but in 1958, we had a device that we could control the turn on, this is the SCR. The turn off would depend on the circuit, but power electronics birth was in 1958. So we do not have yet 100 years of power electronics. We have less than 100 years. In 1945, John von Neumann published uh, a report and how to have a computer. So the computer revolution started here in 1945. And we had the neural network starting here, around here. See, Mac, Kulux, and Pete's neurons, 1943, 1945, and 1948 transistors. And then in 1958, power electronics. So in a matter of uh, one decade or so, we had these lines happening. And then there was a lot of development. We don't have time to go through all of this, but uh, I usually do when I teach only about these uh, timelines. So here we talk about uh, what we call the cybernetics age from 1940 to 1970s. Uh, the cybernetics age was uh, looking to the neural networks in a way that people believe we could have maybe uh, have an electronic brain, like a computer that could be capable to do some calculations, okay? 
this was uh, debunked initially by uh, a book that was published in 1969 by Minsk and Parpet. They showed that neural networks were not capable to be trained if they had more than two layers, okay? So this made uh, a death for neural networks. For, for many years, we didn't have anything happening in neural networks. Pretty much from 1969 until 1985, we didn't have a neural networks. But we had some other things that were not called in neural networks, but they were. When is CMAC by Albus, Cerebellar uh, Modeling Articulator Control, it's a neural network, but he didn't call as a neural network. Stefan Grossberg, uh, he's still alive. He just published a book uh, two years ago. And he used the visual system that we have as a model for a neural network. And then people here in Finland, uh, Kahonen, that's the name of the, the professor, the Hugo Kahonen, he uh, made a new neural network called Self-Organizing Map in 1982. In 1985, the back propagation was invented by three different groups, okay? Uh, back propagation was a, a way that we could train neural networks with more than two layers. We could have the input layer, the output layer, and the middle layer could be trained by having a derivative of the error in respect to the weight. And because everything is mathematics, you just take the function, take the derivative, it's a partial derivative. So you know how much you have to change the previous weight on the connection because there was a narrow at the output of the narrow. Okay, that's the idea of back, back propagation. You go to the to the output and you go internally inside of the neural network, correcting all the weights and blaming the weight by a certain narrow function that depends on this partial derivative. Okay, so that was in 1985. 1985 was the year that I just finished my bachelor's degree. Okay, I was finishing electrical engineering at the University of Sao Paulo in 1985. And by that time, back propagation were just kind of being revived as a field. Oops, there is a kind of, there is a, a trace here. Somebody made a trace in my, in my slide. I don't know how. Okay, uh, in 1985, we also have a few things happening here in electronics, but I would say for sure, because I'm writing a chapter on vector control, that 1985 was also an important year because we had a, a book by Professor Bose. <coughs> we had uh, a workshop by Professors Novotny and Lipu on power electronics. So vector control was just picking up steam around that time, okay? And in electrical power, okay, we had the first DSPs, then we had some FPGAs coming about. Linux was released in 1991, also by a Finnish uh, person. Maybe that's one of the reasons I came to Finland. I was very curious to see how we had a neural network in Linux happening here, by Linux towards. He made this and then he distributed this on the internet. I remember in 1991, I was a student at the University of Tennessee and I had a friend from Germany. He came to my house, he said, Marcel, I just downloaded a new operating system called Linux. I said, oh, really? And then I went to his house and I saw Linux being uh, working in his, uh, IBM PC AT computer. I was amazed, you know, it was amazing. Okay, so here we have a few papers and computers, and I put myself here, okay? As I was introduced, I was one of the first ones to do neural networks and fuzzy logic. In 1992, I wrote a paper uh, for uh, estimation of power electronics waveforms. And I went to my first conference and it was published in 1993, okay? If you continue, this keep going the same. The previous age 
Here is cybernetics and here is called connectionism. Connectionism is when neural networks are associated with biology. And here we have uh, electrotechnology where power systems and power electronics are two fields, okay? And if you continue, connectionism uh, kind of ended around 2005 because everything that was uh, biological related or body related uh, kind of ended here and people got a little bit uh, tired of neural networks until we had another rebirth. The next rebirth for power electronics happened here in 2010, where we had uh, the rectified linear unit for deep learning. That was a way to make big networks to converge. Because if you had uh, three layers or four layers, it could work. But if you had 10 layers, it was impossible to train the inner layers. Because as you propagate your error inside of the neural network, you squash you decrease the amount of change in the weight because it's a derivative and it's a derivative of an exponential function. So it becomes smaller and smaller as you go inside of the neural network. So if you have a lot of layers and you start from the outside, there is a situation that you reach a layer that you don't change that weight. You change by 0 0.00001, which is very little, okay? So your neural network gets stuck and never learns. With deep learning, we can fix that. And one of the things that we have to do is to use uh, rectified linear units and a few other things, okay? But deep learning was important because it allowed the rebirth of neural network. So neural network died twice, like a cat. A cat has seven lives. Neural networks has three so far, okay? Fuzzy logic is kind of the same. It didn't change much. It's still very powerful, but it didn't change much. In, uh, in power electronics, uh, we had uh, renewable energy and intelligent control as a smart grid. So we could say that here in power electronics, we also had a lot of developments that allowed a unified uh, merging of two fields. So I don't know why we have this this kind of, I think you are seeing here a kind of uh, a yeah, trace. There is some, yeah. Uh, this is bothering me. Lines, yeah. I don't know why this is happening. Let's see, stop sharing, then I'll share again. Maybe it works. It's like uh, Control Alt Dell. <laughs> yeah, it's something, yeah. Just... Okay, it's fine. So, Participants can your see your screen. So I will put my PowerPoint there, just a minute. I'm sorry I have to restart, but yeah, that was kind of uh, taking my attention, okay? So I, yeah, have yeah. To, I have to bring back my PowerPoint. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. PPT, presentation. Okay, we are back to, to my PowerPoint. So it's yeah. Virtual. Yeah, now, yeah, it's clear. Okay, so now I don't have those those kind of traces yeah. affecting me. I was around my time. I would like to ask the audience if they would like to write some questions in the chat section. So, that, yeah. Yeah, but we are not meanwhile, finished yeah. yet. So, let's. Yeah, let's meanwhile, yeah, meanwhile, you are. Yeah, because I have not received like uh, questions or something. Okay. I just encourage the audience to just, ah, okay. like, if they have some, um, you know, questions in parallel with, the, sure. with your uh, speech. So, in this part of the circular economy, I, I quickly go through it, you know, because we do not have time. As I said, I have a lot of slides and I have to kind of target a little bit a one hour presentation, or otherwise it becomes two hours and unfortunately it cannot be today. But in the circular economy, we, we discuss about uh, the old idea of reduce, reuse, and recycle, you know, it's the cradle to cradle manufacturing model. So you have something, you use it, and then you dump. 
And when you dump, you try to recycle, of course, but it's a recycle of, you know, you take a whole car and the car becomes uh, metal and plastic and that's it, metal and plastic, you know, or if you take a house, you take apart, then you have wood, but you also have a lot of glass and a lot of uh, paper, things like that, you know. So uh, if we think that uh, we have to, we have to design products from other products, we have a concept called circular economy, where products are made to be made again, okay? You just take something, and then you track the life of that material or that product and when it's ready it becomes something else okay instead of be, being dumped and being just recycled by basic materials so we could have uh, the idea of a circular economy based on a smart city we have to have a lot of uh, electronics and communications but i have to skip this we have to have a green technology evolution in research, education, and new industry because renewable energy matters. But matters for you, me, and our generation, how? Okay, you can look to renewable energy by the amount of power that we have and the time variation. For example, sunshine could be seconds to hours, okay? PVs, because they are also from sunshine, they are also seconds to hours biofuels uh, you can store in a tank so it's a whole year of storage wind maybe hours for wind farms tide uh, there is a repetition of tide of 12 hours and finally after so many years that i i am alive i understood how are tides you can think it's weird <laughs> but if i ask you to explain to me how a tide works maybe you get confused you know we have, uh, we have the moon attracting the water and the, the earth rotates inside of that bulge of water. Yeah, that's the way to understand tide, you know? So there is a 12 hour rotation. After you understand that, it's simple, but it took me time to understand what's a tide. Waves, hydro, deep geothermal. So when you look about uh, the intensity and frequency of renewable energy, you have to see when they are available and for how long, okay? If you look to the electrical power, I also sometimes take the next three slides and I talk a lot, so I cannot do that here, but we can start to discuss this basic way of teaching. This is the way that we teach, you know, even today. We just assume that we have a central generation, then you raise the voltage, the voltage is, I don't know, a few hundred kilovolts and the power you travel, and then reach a center that you have a substation, you lower the voltage. So we still teach like that, okay? But it's a way to understand the system, okay? In the past, it was like that. Everything was unidirectional. So I'm not wasting too much time here in this figure, but this was 30 years ago. And then this is still true for many places. We have SCADA, transmission center, a little bit of solar and wind in some substation. But what's happening today is that we have more and more smart grid integration, integration, local storage, net metering. So we have um, more solar, more wind, and we have the addition of electric cars. The electric cars uh, allow a flexible use of energy because you can take your car and you can charge in a, in a bi-directional power charger in your house or in your work and then you can travel and then if you still have uh, energy in your in your battery you can use in another place so it becomes this kind of flexible power plant that has four wheels and a steering wheel and you can drive okay so we have more and more integration of this this is the future it's the present but it's the future as well so the power system needs we could say that the smart grid is a two-way dialogue of electricity information. We have to convert electricity, but we have to also exchange information. So we have to have networks of networks. We have to have a network of communications, controls, computers, automation. So a, a smart grid enables those new technologies to be integrated 
to further uh, uh, allow wind and solar energy production, plug in electric cars. The smart grid is the new infrastructure of today's grid. And for that, we have to have people who are capable to work. So I have been advocating for the past 10 years that power electronics in one end, where you have some competence in circuits, in power electronics, in computer project base, versus power systems competence in power theory, in electrical power circuits, in power flow, voltage stability. We have to provide our students and young generation an overlapping of those. And this is allowed by the smart grid. The smart grid needs people cap capable to travel from power electronics to power systems or from power systems to power electronics. So those people will have a unified understanding of power systems, power electronics, power quality and renewable energy. And then we can discuss what kind of problems we have. See, we have one and two and three and four. Three and four is repeated here, five and six and seven. Why? Because I am um, showing that I have slow dynamics versus fast dynamics. So there are many things that we do in power electronics like post swift modulation or maybe DQ and PQ techniques, torque control of electrical machines. So this requires you to work on the range of microseconds. You can work on the range of milliseconds for active power control, speed control of electrical machines. You can work on the range of seconds if you are doing uh, reactive power management uh, operator for power systems is on the order of seconds, okay? Uh, then we have uh, things that are slower in minutes and hours. Scheduling could be years for long-term planning, okay? And could be steady state, okay? So we have to understand that a problem in the power uh, systems uh, conversion, we require you to navigate solutions that must be implemented in the order of microseconds and milliseconds to solutions that will be implemented in the order of uh, seconds and minutes and hours, okay? And there is a unified way to do that and to discuss this. Uh, we can skip this, otherwise I cannot talk. But then we have computational power versus simulation speed and electromagnetic analysis. We have to do some uh, understanding of transient control in microseconds. So this is a time domain transient analysis or fast dynamic simulation power energy management. That's a steady state and phase analysis. We may have to use harmonics and Fourier analysis, or if you work in the in the in the range of hours and years, this is energy management and optimization. So when you when you listen to a power system person to talk about optimization, usually is a study that uh, is done for a utility or for a government or for a big company to do something and install something to have a certain uh, hosting capacity in the in the grid and that's it you do that is optimized that's it it's not real time okay real time is something that changes so if you do energy management optimization for a long term planning uh, you can do the best optimization but it's done once okay Okay, so this would be the sequence of talk if we had. So I would discuss about smart systems with fuzzy logic. I quickly go through it because we do not have time, okay? But I promise to try to at least motivate you. So I discuss, I have uh, a books and I have a course in fuzzy logic. By the way, we are offering here a summer course. So if you are listening to this, uh, to this uh, talk, uh, you can write, to me if you are in Finland, because if you are outside Finland, I don't think you'll be able to do it. But if you are in Finland, there are ways for you to be registered in our summer school here in Universal Vasa that will happen at May 31st, June 1st and June 2nd. 
And one of the courses that we offer will be AI and machine learning for advanced power systems. Another one is digital control for power electronics. And another one is power systems, stability and protection. Three courses, okay? So I'll be talking a little bit about fuzzy, what's fuzziness, how you define a fuzzy number you, you, or a fuzzy set, you use membership functions, and then how we have operations, how we have statements, how we can make uh, the definition of a certain input that is defined with fuzzy, fuzzy statements. For example, I could say, if the pressure is high and the temperature is low, then the valve actuator will be medium high. So I just made a semantical description of a possible control rule that's completely with words, but I can't translate those words and that statement that has an end and it has a then, it's a if, da da da, and da da da, and da da da, then, da 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 da, da it's a rule, okay? I can make several of those rules and I can make a rule base and I use fuzzy logic to implement that uh, uh, rule base in a way that will become a control systems. So that's what, what we, we, we can do here. There are some ways to work with the fuzzy sets to find the diffusification, to combine rules. So this is a combination of true rules about the distance of two cars when you're driving. And then there is another way that's not really uh, uh, only fuzzy. See, if the distance between two cars is medium and the speed of car is medium, then brake medium. It's a, it's a semantical rule, okay? But here, if uh, X1 is fuzzy set one, if X1 is, is small and X2 is low, then this rule here gives me a certain equation. That equation is a multilinear equation. I have here parameters multiplied by the input. So this is X1 multiplied by B11. This is X2 multiplied by B12. So that means I make a fuzzy consideration, but the output is an equation and that equation has coefficients that can be optimized in real time by recursive least square. Yeah, that's the easiest way to do it. I did that a few years ago. We can use fuzzy logic for identify your system. Usually in control systems, we identify the plant. What you see here is the mathematical way to identify a plant and then a designer controller. For a fuzzy controller, you define the uh, operator, okay? So you identify the operator and then you replace the operator to control that unknown plant. That's the difference of identification of process versus identification of control of the operation. We can make supervisory management control and then we can apply, for example, for vector control, fuzzy logic can be applied for a motor drive. This is the way to do it. Then I discuss neural networks. Neural networks has a long history. I just touched a little bit about the history. It started in 1940s developed until 1969 until Minsky and Parpet wrote a book saying that we could not train a neural network with more than two layers. And then it was revitalized in 1985 with backpropagation with a solid and steady growth until 2005. And I was lucky to be on this part of this history because I made my contributions in fuzzy logic estimation and signal processing using neural networks for vector control and also in wind turbines control, okay? But pretty much in neural networks, we have uh, two paths, I would say, the feed forward neural networks or the competitive and associative neural networks, okay? So uh, I, when I teach neural networks, I usually teach this, which is back propagation most of the time. And then I teach this, which could be Hebbian learning or back propagation or linear vector quantization. And then if you just uh, apply the ideas of deep learning, you take feedback neural networks and we have the convolutional neural networks and the associative neural networks, we have the recurrent or the reinforcement learning. 
So we have a new class today called deep learning, but deep learning is pretty much a big neural network that you have to train in a certain way that allows to be trained. Okay, so don't be afraid of deep learning because deep learning is a neural network. And if you understand what you are doing, you can use a tool that helps you to write the code. Okay. So here I talk a little bit how we can do the correction of weights, how it be a flow chart to, to train a neural network, what kind of procedures could be used. This is a typical feed for the neural networks, a typical feedback competitive neural networks. Those would be the activation functions for the neuron. The one that allow the deep learning is this one here. Okay. This is the one. Sometimes you use that one that's called leaky because there is a little bit of leakage here. This is very small compared to that. Okay. And this code here is a way to compute the output of a deep learning neural network that is used for classification, usually in convolutional neural networks. So I sometimes teach linear vector quantization, the Cajonan, the self organizing map counter propagation. So these are matters that I teach. Uh, we can discuss about industrial applicability of artificial neural networks, where they are used. We have some functional features. Do you use for pattern recognition? Do you use for associative memory? Do you use for functional approximation, for modeling control? So depending on what you are using as a functional use, you can have a structure that is recommended for that. I publish a paper. I think it was 2004 with uh, Magali Meirelles and Paulo Almeida. They were Brazilians working with me. Paulo was my PhD student. Magali was working with me, but she was not my student. They are from Brazil, in Minas Gerais. And we published that uh, many years ago where we try to understand what kind of structure in neural network could be used for industrial applications, okay? So here we have what kind of neural network topology can be used for prediction, classification, data association, and what kind of uh, network we can use for that. So what's a smart power system? Uh, is a power system that has some enhancements, okay? Not because the other power systems are not smart, but they have enhancements, they have facilitations. So we can talk about deep learning for smart power systems, okay? So we don't have time for that. So I'm gonna skip here. Machine learning is something that you teach in our summer course. And this is a kind of neural network that's very useful. It's called convolutional neural network. You can see that you can have several layers and uh, you can use for pattern recognition. For example, this case here, Suppose I have an image processing of a part of this object. This object is a car, okay? But suppose I just evaluate uh, a piece of this, okay? And then I go to this neural network. Uh, hopefully, if my neural network has knowledge and it was trained, just by looking by some sections of that uh, device, we could define you know, using softmax, which is that uh, I showed you before, if that's a car or a truck or a van or a bicycle, okay? So convolutional neural networks are usually useful for image recognition, pattern recognition, classification. If you have huge data, you can classify, okay? You can classify if your data is uh, in a certain feature, I would say. Then we have the recurrent neural networks, something that I like because I remember studying recurrent neural networks in my PhD. But then there was this new, new thing that happened on the past 10 years called LSTM, okay? Uh, LSTM is long short-term memory. It's a very, how to say, recurrent on steroids. There's several feedback paths, several gates and constructions. But uh, there's a paper in 1997 written by these people here that gives the idea and how to use. And there has been a lot of uh, codes available on GitHub, available on Kaggle. Even my students, they wrote something. 
but this is amazing because it's recurrent. You can identify things way in the past. Suppose you have a book. Suppose, suppose you have a book. Suppose you have the book and you just read the last chapter. And suppose I tell you, okay, you read the last chapter of this book. Can you figure out the whole book? I'm going to say, no, I cannot figure out, but I can imagine. So you imagine, okay? So a neural network can learn the whole book and can understand how this uh, character evolved, okay? Uh, for example, if you talk about 100 years of solitude, we had several generations of people. So when you go to the end of the book, everything at the last page is different from the first page. But a neural network that's possible to be recurrent could, be, could learn all these things. So we can put them in tandem, so they are very capable for very large amount of processing. And there is a neural network I developed with Almeida, the same person I had a paper in industrial applicability. Uh, now we see that we are doing we are doing deep learning, okay? Because we did uh, long term and short term memories. We did uh, things that in now in our papers we wrote that this part was the long-term memory and this part was the short-term memory. The short-term memory was uh, implemented with recursive least square and the long-term memory was implemented with the CMAX cerebellar uh, modeling articulator control, but with fuzzy. So I am surprised we did that. Very few people know about this paper, but this is something that was really interesting, there is a thesis from him. Unfortunately, it's in Portuguese, okay? But we have papers. Then I talk about smart grid, some more applications of neural networks. We don't have time, sorry. Then I can talk about wind system. This was my PhD dissertation, but uh, my papers about this are still well cited because people go back to this paper to see how this was implemented. We have three fuzzy logic controllers to optimize how a wind turbine will be put on the best operating point. See, this is the search for the best operating point. I can go here or I can come back here, okay? And then we have fuzzy logic control for all of them. We also, I also had this neural network estimation for vector control. I use a neural network like this. And we can use time delayed neural networks for system with dynamics. We can use model predictive control in a configuration like this, it's like a model reference, but with neural network. An uh, adaptive inverse model based control. We could compare, for example, energy price for two different electrical power companies. One is in ever hour, the data, another is ever 15 minutes. And if this is a neural network that's trained, maybe you can train with one kind of data and still be capable to predict the data in the other, in the other way. So this is the code here. On your right here, you have a code and how to train this simple neural network, okay? This is a neural network and this is a neural network and there is a node here called the recurrent neural. So this is something that I learned a long time ago, um, 1994, when I studied this. And now this has been, uh, how to say, augmented with LSTM. LSTM is this model, but with more complexities, okay? This is the model, see? So that is the concatenation, and this is the neural network that I just described uh, five minutes ago. We can use AI for smart power systems. We can use for digital twin. I have a book. If you want to look to my book published by IET, Artificial Intelligence for Smart Power Systems. I teach my course here, Universe of Asa, based on this book. We could talk about circular economy with the 17 sustainable development goals of uh, United Nations. And I believe that if you do all of this, so I'm, I'm gonna go quickly, okay? Let's say you have all this theory, plus wireless neural network, software defined radio, plus signal processing, machine learning, cyber physical systems, plus understanding of wind turbines, hydro turbines, and fluids, 
plus maybe understand thermodynamics or computer science and computer engineering industrial automation plus understanding batteries and fuel cells solar cells so if you have all these cards here and you know that and you could multiply or make a convolution with power electronics power systems and power qualities and renewable energy and electrical machines and drives and energy management optimization electric vehicles technology transportation smart grid smart system city sustainability we can get to contribute to our society for clean energy and we can work on jedi you know jedi yeah justice equity diversity and inclusiveness for all we still have two billion of people in our world that do not have access to electricity we have to make our world more fair more just and if you can contribute for a clean energy sustainable energy and maybe hopefully an affordable energy that can really change your life we are making our humanity better thank you for the opportunity to talk to you with this dialogue understand our real needs understand your story in this life so we dream we dare and we do thank you very much so if you have okay. few thank questions. you professor yeah thank you professor marcelo for such interesting presentation uh actually we have received a question from one of the audience that ai is already applied for multiple applications uh, uh so the question is how far or deep uh, is the ai inside the industry uh, is it being welcomed or there are some restrictions due to uh, sharing data sharing and security issues Oh, uh, this question is very complex and has several nuances. Okay, so it's very difficult to really, to really answer that question. But I will try my best. Yeah. First, uh, uh, my camera is not showing me, but it's okay. You can listen to me, isn't it? No, I, I'm not sure. I can cannot see. Uh, no, if you listen to me, it's fine because I see that my my camera is dark. Something happened here. Yeah, so, also my side, my side. I cannot open my camera. I don't know why. Ah, okay. Uh, it's Zoom. It's okay. But uh, you listen yeah, to me, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, okay. See, on the past five years or so, people have been talking more and more about AI. Okay, so AI. And then people talk about deep learning. And then people talk about blockchain. So you have to be careful because when you talk to industry people, they want to please the industry, you know, they do not want to please you. Okay, so if somebody works for a big company, a big multinational, they want to please their boss and the boss of their boss. Okay, so if their bosses believe that uh, AI is important for the company, they will have an investment. Sure. Okay, I, I am an academic and I try to teach my students and I try to work with the research people who work with me to be prepared to do meaningful power electronics and power systems for renewable energy. And sometimes we have to use AI. AI is not, is not my daily research, okay? My daily research will be really more power electronics and power systems and smart grid. But when it's possible to apply quasi logic or neural networks or something that is meant to help that problem, and the student or research understand how to do it, I am pleased to do it, okay? I taught a course a few months ago and one of our students, our students, she uh, learned fuzzy logic and she applied fuzzy logic for her dissertation. It was a new thing for her, we just had a paper accepted and published, okay? So I was very happy to motivate this uh, young lady who is a PhD student, she's about to finish. Uh, so she found that was very useful because she could eventually using fuzzy logic to simplify the management of a few a few control issues in her system. Okay, so when you find that fuzzy logic or neural networks or deep learning can help you to do something, you use it. If you don't, you don't need. You have a polynomial that works and you, or you have a differential equation that you know or you have a state variable system uh, uh, a state system that you know for them uh, uh, induction machines induction machines use dq okay 
and then you have four differential equations that are electrical and one differential equation that are mechanical. So with five differential equations, they are nonlinear, but we have need five differential equations. We model the induction machine. Actually, we don't need to develop a neural network to replace that because we know the physics, okay? We should use AI or you should use these tools when they are meant to be used because that will enhance uh, the information, that will enhance the understanding, or maybe you have a lot of data, but you don't have a, mat a mathematical function, or maybe you have a good explanation how things work, and then it's easy to write uh, fuzzy logic rules, okay? So we have to use the right tool for the right job, okay? One of my, one of my hobbies is woodworking. So I work with wood, and I have pleasure with that. So when I have a tool, and my tool is a hammer, uh, you can tap the hammer very lightly and you do this just to take a block inside another one, or you can tap very hard, but you cannot use a hammer like a screwdriver, okay? So you, you're gonna use an AI when it's the right tool for the right issues that should be done. And the industry sometimes, they want to say they have something because they want to have a publicity and they want to show that they are uh, ahead or not. I'm not saying that uh, they are not developed. They are, okay, particularly high-tech companies, you know, Google and Facebook and even Netflix, they're using a lot of uh, AI for uh, their systems, okay? But we also have other companies in electrical power that are using artificial intelligence for maybe forecasting of energy prices or um, uh, demand side management or what can I do here with this big data that help you to make decisions, okay? So my, my question to your complex question is a complex answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Actually, we have received another question. I just curious if you have time to answer uh, this second one? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. And the second one is like, how can we make a protocol or a model of AI to ensuring the digital transformation towards smart cities? Okay. How can I use AI to enhance smart cities? Yeah, just to make a protocol, you know, it's like, because now they are not applied in the industry. So we need yeah. a protocol or maybe I can say it's like, maybe standard or something to apply AI to. Uh, yeah. A smart city is, is dependent on how the city wants to have automation and how the citizens of that city or that state or that country accept that digitalization, okay? In some countries, the citizens do not have much choice, okay? With all the respect, okay, all the respect. If you go to China, it's the Chinese government decides what they want, okay? So maybe the citizens there will not decide exactly on the automation of the city. But if you are in European city or North America in a few places where maybe they have the resource, they have uh, uh, money and they want to make a city more intelligent, maybe they will start by making automation of buildings to be more efficient with heating and cooling. And maybe those buildings will have cameras for understanding the occupation and the set points of individual rooms. Or maybe that building will have as well some uh, energy storage and that energy storage could be communicating with the local utility. So at night, that building or that village will contribute to the power grid somehow or during the day, okay? So this uh, depends, uh, the AI here will be to capture uh, uh, analysis that are difficult to be made with a mathematical evaluation. We learn in school, how is a transfer function? And then we learn that given a transfer function, how I can have a PI controller, a lead lag controller, and one of the first issues that students are, are, are how to say, uh, uh, clueless is how do I know the transfer function? Because if you ask this for a control systems professor, he, he or she is gonna give the transfer function and work on the transfer function. 
how do I know the transfer function from, uh, let's say, uh, heating my water in my house, how that's relevant to the water reservoir in my city? You know, let's give this example that's a little weird. There is no transfer function like that because the, the way to have a mathematical evaluation of that will not be cost effective. Who wants to do a mathematical evaluation for that? But maybe you can understand. You can understand by data, you can understand by operation. And if you understand by operation, or if you have a lot of data, you can use neural networks, you can use fuzzy logic. And if you need a huge uh, database, you can apply using deep learning. So uh, depending on what you're doing that uh, is not possible, it's, or the modeling is very ill, very difficult to implement, you can go to AI and then you can implement something that will be useful for that particular situation, okay? So I believe that the smart cities will be smarter as depending on how relevant is the automation of that city. For example, uh, let's say here uh, where I live uh, in Finland, okay? So let's say that the city is so smart that uh, as you, you are all walking at night, you feel that some lights will turn on and turn off automatically. Or maybe the city is so smart that maybe the taxes will run more frequently uh, close the time that the students are ending their parties and they have to have a taxi home because they are drunk, you know? I don't know, that would be good, okay? Because they, they drank a lot, so they have to go to their homes with car or walking. And it would be nice to have this. So how much of automation a city is interested to provide for the better service of the citizens? And what kind of influence that has on people? People accept that, people are okay with that, people are not okay with that, they feel that it's invasive, so it depends also. And so there is a social perspective here that is not my area, so I cannot evaluate, but this is a multidisciplinary uh, team that could evaluate how AI could be helpful for smart cities. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Professor Marcelo. Uh, I would like also to ask about, uh, I think that AI for, it could also work like for power electronic and for other application like forecasting and like this one. Actually, I try um, myself. I try to apply like AI to power systems, but we have received some like you know uh, comments that uh, uh, it is not practical for sometimes to trust like AI to make like distributed for example for example distributed distribution system management for example to trust AI fully. So, what do you think? How we can you know tackle this issue with AI? Uh, maybe people. If you're talking that your paper was rejected because somebody wrote no, that, yeah, 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 it's, it's common. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I used to have lots of rejections of papers 25, 30 years ago because nobody trusted fuzzy logic or new yeah, actually, works. In there IT are many, yeah, many authors just against this policy to apply AI to power system. Actually, I work with application of AI to power system. And it is uh -huh. like power electronic because, you know, you can uh, say that it's uh, AI is better than like, or we have like neural network, you can replace the traditional control for the inverter. So it's it can be acceptable. But if we go to like microgrid level or distribution system and we have multiple sources, they said now nah, uh, this one we cannot, for example, we cannot trust or something. This yeah, okay. If it's a theoretical person, that theoretical person is gonna ask you, can you prove the stability? And yeah. then I'm gonna say, ah, I made simulation. They are gonna say, this does not prove stability okay? because stability for a control systems perspective. Mm is a mathematical definition, okay? But you can have initially AI as aiding, assisting. So mm. you have a system that's operational and you have, a, let's say a digital twin. And oh, then yeah. you start making some suggestions that the people who are on the operation room can see what the AI suggested. 
and maybe by improving and little by little accepting what the digital twin is doing with AI, they will eventually accept and say, this um, system is working, so oh. let's use it. Uh, of course, there is always the potential issue that there is a fault, okay? Mm -hmm. But humans also have failures and faults. So yeah. uh, we have to see we have to see the ethics of that. Uh, if there is any life that's in danger because everything is controlled by a computer, okay? Yeah. Or if there is something that uh, is important to have a computer controlling, because let's say, for example, okay, yeah. in the United States, the nuclear power there, they have the uh, nuclear energy. I do not know because this is a secret, okay, but we know that there is a mountain there called the Yucca Mountains that goes uh, the Rocky Mountains to Nevada, where they dig holes and they have a, nu a lot of nuclear waste there. But they cannot go inside the mountains. They have to send a robot. And the robot must see everything and do everything because people cannot go in those uh, tunnels anymore. There's a lot of relativity there. So, or, so sometimes you have to use AI or you have, yeah. you have to use a lot of intelligence because it's impossible for humans to survive in a radiate, uh, radioactive uh, place. Or maybe if you have... Uh, uh, planet uh, operation in Mars or uh, another place that's impossible for humans to go there. So you have to rely with the tools that you, you have, you know. Yeah. I that's Unfortunately, yeah. I have to stop. I'm sorry, but I have another yeah. meeting in four minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I, have to leave my, <laughs> I, I, I cannot I left... close the meeting. Actually, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's like... Uh speech and this area is very interesting I think for all the audience and thank you Professor Marcelo for, for such uh, for insight about the application of AI uh, to power systems and I hope uh, for the participant to have like a good day okay. okay everybody have a good day thank you for the opportunity and hope to see you in person sometime okay have a good okay. day have a nice bye. time bye